you would be turning your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. There's an interesting message delivered here. And to try to help impress upon us the gravity of the situation, we're going to be taking the ESV's interpretation of the text here, and you'll see what I mean here in a moment, to kind of ask ourselves the question, are we like soiled undergarments? Go ahead. <laughs> are we like soiled undergarments? There's a reason for that. Um, one, I couldn't find a picture of a loincloth, and this was kind of the closest to simulate, to illustrate the message here. Okay, so, <clears throat> Jeremiah was, of course, we know, prophet of God, who delivered a message to Judah about their impending time in Babylon. And it's Jeremiah that told them they would be in Babylon for 70 years. It was the book of Jeremiah, his writings, that later Daniel would read and be reminded of the fact that the 70 years was coming to a close. But in this particular section, God used several things as emblems or to be emblematic of what he was going to do to Judah. And what we're reading here, I think Brother Chuck read from the New King James translation, um, the ASV and the King James is very similar, linen sash, linen girdle. The New American Standard Bible says linen waistband. The ESV uses the term loincloth. Now, the significance is, is kind of important to this. The loincloth, or, and we're going to work with that understanding, the loincloth cloth was a very personal part of the garment, very intimate part of the garment. Um, we, uh, we would understand it as our underwear, our undergarments that we would wear. And the symbolism here, we focus on the intimacy of that for just a couple of minutes. Because when we get down to what this is going to represent, it's supposed to represent the intimacy between God and his people. But instead of clinging to God as they were supposed to have had, they ended up clinging to something else. Um, it has been suggested, if you'll remember with Abraham, when he had his servant, um, Eliphaz, Eliphaz, I think, had his servant to swear to him that he would find a proper wife for Isaac, the text says he put his hand under his thigh when he swore to that. Now, there's nothing odd about that. For them, it was a sign of intimacy to show the closeness there um, within that uh, commitment that he was taking on. So the Lord uses the linen cloth, if you would, the, the, um, the, the way, the girdle, the, the, some translations say girdle, to illustrate that Israel, Judah specifically, was good for nothing. And let's talk about that here tonight. Jeremiah and the linen loincloth. Notice with me in the first two verses, and I'll be reading from the ESV. Thus says the Lord to me. This is what the Lord told Jeremiah. Go and buy a linen loincloth and put it around your waist and do not dip it in water. So I bought a loincloth according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. Now, some scholars think that the idea where he says not to dip it in water means he wasn't to wash it. Buy the loincloth, put the loincloth on, wear the loincloth, but don't wash the loincloth. Okay, seems like an odd request, but this is what God told Jeremiah to do, and Jeremiah did this. And as I mentioned a while ago, different translations will offer different words for this, which tells us they're still trying to guess a little bit. There's not specific, but it still puts it around this intimate part of the male's body in regards to their apparel. All right, so he did this. He did what God told him to do. Now let's start in verse 3. In the next section here, And the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the loincloth that you have bought, which is around your waist, and arise, go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a cleft of the rock. Okay, so you've got this new loincloth. You've been wearing it for a while. It's not been washed. 
Now go to the river Euphrates and find a rock there and a cleft, kind of thing, maybe a crack within the rock there, and take this loincloth and stick it in there and hide it. Okay? Can do that. Can do that. So Jeremiah does. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. Now, verse 6. He says, so I, he says, there we go. He says, so after many days, the Lord said to me, arise, go to the Euphrates and take from there the, the loincloth that I commanded you to hide there. So let's stop for a moment. Have you ever found a dirty sock hiding somewhere in your house? Okay. It's tolerable because it's your sock or your children's sock. But imagine if it was someone else's sock. Now let's amp it up a little bit. It's a loincloth. So the Lord tells me, go back to your Euphrates River, where you hid the loincloth after many, many days it has been there. Take the loincloth from the spot where you hid it. So he says, then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the loincloth from the place where I had hidden it. And behold, the loincloth was spoiled. It was good for nothing. Think about that. The loincloth was now spoiled. It had been worn. It hadn't been washed. It had been hidden in the ground, in the rock, in the dirt. He had to dig it up to find it. And when he does, it was spoiled and it was good for nothing. All right, so what's the purpose of this? An odd story, to say the least. But what's the purpose of it? Well, it's quite simple. Let's read there in verses 8 and 9. Then the word of the Lord came to me, thus says the Lord, even so will I spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. All right, so the loincloth represented Judah and Jerusalem. Now think about that here in a little bit. The intimacy that is seen within this garment is be significant coming up here in a minute. So he says that this represents Judah and Jerusalem. And he says, I will spoil, notice this, I will spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. That's what all this represented. This was supposed to have been a garment that one would wear and wash and, and take care of and protect and, and, and use in your daily wearing. It was a very intimate garment, if you stop and consider that. But now... Instead of being something that could be cleansed and used and kept and that would cling to as it should, it was good for nothing. And this was Israel or Judah. This was the pride of Jerusalem, the pride of Judah. And he says there in the text, I will spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. Now we know when this happened. This was foretelling the coming of the Babylonian captivity. The city of Jerusalem would have to be later rebuilt. The walls would have to be rebuilt by Nehemiah. The temple would have to be rebuilt by Zerubbabel in the first wave that would go back. Jerusalem was going to be left destroyed, left in a sense, a, 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 a state of destruction. But why? Why did the Lord do this? Well, look there in verse 10. He says, this evil people who refuse to hear my words. Notice that. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them shall be like a loincloth, which is good for nothing. Now, something significant here in his charge against them. First off, it says they stubbornly follow their own heart. They've gone after other gods to serve them. They worship them, shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. This is where the intimacy of the loincloth comes in. When you think about the loincloth and the part of the body that you wear the loincloth around, there's an intimacy there between that and the material, in, in a manner of speaking, as we go through here. Instead of them being with God, as they should have been, think about this. They should have been hanging on the waist of God. They should have been around his waist. They should have been there with him this whole time. They allowed themselves to be 
around the false gods. They allowed themselves to develop this intimate relationship, in a manner of speaking, with sin and iniquity and the false gods of the world around them. Instead of clinging to Jehovah God, they clung to the world, to the gods of the world, and worshipped them. And as a result, they have become a loincloth, soiled and good for nothing. Now, verse 11. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, this is why I was saying what we did about the intimacy here. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. Well, stop there. See, what he, he, well, this is the analogy. He had made them for him so they might cling to him, so that they would be with him, be there with him as his people for his praise, for their praise and their glory and their service unto him. But they would not listen. The latter part of verse 11, but they would not listen. Now do you see the significance of this illustration? The loincloth represented the intimacy that should have existed between the people and God. They were his people. He should have been their God. But as a result, they went unto others. And they became like this soiled linen loincloth. Good for nothing, the text says. So next time you're turning through the Bible, you come to Jeremiah 13. Now you know what that one's all about. Now you move on from this, you'll go into another uh, illustration to represent the people. But this is the one I want to focus on for the remainder of the lesson. Imagine being a people of God, but yet being called good for nothing. Think about that for a moment. Now, this is not intended to be some insult. This is a statement of truth. These were God's people. They should have been worshiping him and serving him and following after him. If you go back to the history there a little bit, go back a couple of kings to Manasseh. Manasseh is the one that passed his children through the fire, worshiping Molech and Chemosh, and he wasn't the only one. And then along comes Josiah a couple of generations later, and Josiah tries to make all the changes that God wants. And he makes a lot of changes, but the text tells us it wasn't enough because of the sins of the, the iniquities of Manasseh and the people were too great. And as a result, according to this, God found them good for nothing. So the question that I have for us to consider tonight, is there a possibility of us be ever coming to the point where we are good for nothing? Now, I'm not talking about the body of Christ. It's perfect. The body of Christ, the gates of Hades, will not prevail against that. The body of Christ will never suffer division. The body of Christ will never suffer impurities. The body of Christ is composed of the faithful followers who walk in fellowship with God, with Christ, and with the Spirit of God. But as individual Christians, if we allow ourselves to walk in darkness, then are we finding ourselves into that category? Well, we're good for nothing. Let me give you a, a few things here to consider that may cause us, that would cause us to become good for nothing if we follow this path. How about if our salt loses its flavor? Let's start there because of the connecting words there, good for nothing. Over in Matthew chapter 5, there in verse 13, notice what Jesus says here in the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Think about that. Salt that is good for nothing. It's no longer, it never longer has a saltiness. It no longer has its flavor. It's no longer useful for, for preserving things. And it's only good for one thing, to be thrown out and trampled under feet. Well, this is what Jesus is telling us. We are the salt of the earth. We are that, that which should bring goodness in a manner of, speaking, manner of speaking to the earth. 
But if we've lost that saltiness, if we've lost that goodness, then what are we good for? Here's another one saying in the same context there, now verses 14 through 16. Here he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. If we hide our light, then what are we good for? If we allow our, height, our light to be hidden, because we don't want the world to see our, our faithful position and service unto God, if we become ashamed of it, then what are we good for? It's kind of like you, nowadays you buy LED lights and, and they rate them based on their brightness and everything. You see the commercial, the guy has a, a light and he shines it up to the International Space Station. and they, Well, not quite that far. But you see all these great commercials about these real strong lights. So your wife lets you spend $200 on this real powerful light. And then the power goes out. And she says, quick, grab the light. No, I think we need to save it. We don't need it right now. Kind of a waste of money, wasn't it? Well, we are supposed to be the light of the world. Like a city that is set on a hill, it cannot be hidden. But if we take our light and we put a cover over it, then we are hiding that which needs to be shining forth. And if we hide that light, then we become, like Judah, good for nothing. Something else. If we take part in the works of darkness, turn over with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Now you'll find something common as we go through all these. Brother, we're talking about open rebellion. We're talking about allowing ourselves to willingly walk the path of darkness, the path that leads us away from the Lord. We quit worrying about the consequences. We quit worrying about what God has done for us. We quit worrying about what is right and what is wrong. We're going to walk through a path of rebellion just like Judah did. Notice what Ephesians 5, beginning verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they, do, uh, that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. So go back to the idea of let your light so shine before men. Go back to that idea here. Well, here we are a light that is to be shining into the world. But if we, you know, what would be the reason why we want to put a cap on that light? Well, it may be what we've read here. Maybe we've chosen to engage in the unfruitful works of darkness. If we do that, then what are we good for? Anytime we're walking in darkness, we're not walking in the light. Anytime we choose a path that leads us away from God, we're not walking in fellowship with God. It's that simple. We have to not choose rebellion, but choose service and come back to him. Judah, they rebelled against God. And they spent 70 years in Babylonian captivity. And even after he brought them back, it was kind of like pulling teeth to get them to serve him properly. That is not acceptable. That is not the way of a true follower of Christ, a true child of God. What else can make us good for nothing? Well, how about this one? Romans 13, verses 12 through 13. We make opportunity to gratify the lusts of the flesh notice here romans chapter 12 the apostle paul in his letter to the church at rome notice what he says there beginning in verse 13 of chapter 12 he says he says continue contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse them Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Let me see. Hold on just a second here. Chapter 13. Stay there. You're wondering, what are you reading, John? That was chapter 12. Chapter 13, verse 12. This sounds better. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness. Notice that. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. 
but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now that's how we're supposed to live. But if we make provisions for the flesh to gratify its lust and its, and its desires, if, we not, if we're not walking properly as in the day, but we engage in the sins listed here in verse 13, if we do those things contrary, we're not casting off the works of darkness, we're not, we, are, we are not casting them off, and we're certainly not putting on the works of light. And if that's the way we cho choose to live our lives, back to the question, what are we good for? Now again, please understand, we're talking about open rebellion. That's what it boils down to. Open rebellion. You know, when you think about Peter for just a moment, Peter denied the Lord three times. Judas sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Judas went out and hung himself, but Peter repented and was forgiven. One, you have a case in point of where Peter genuinely gave in to the temptation, and he was sorry for what he did, and he was forgiven. The other one, Judas, while he showed a measure of remorse, instead of going back to do what he should have done and repented, he took his own life. We have to understand we're talking about a decision we make where we willingly turn away. We willingly walk away from God. Let's continue forward a little bit more. We can become good for nothing if we refuse to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Peter. Turn with me to 2 Peter in chapter 3 as we bring that letter to a close. 2 Peter chapter 3. Notice what he says there in his final words there. He says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So we're supposed to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What if we don't? What if we stop studying? What if we stop growing in the knowledge of Christ? What if we stop growing in his grace? And someone said, well, how can we not grow in the grace of God? It's real simple. Quit serving God. Quit following him. Quit doing his will. If we get to that point, then what have we become good for? The next one, 2 Timothy 2, 23. We become good for nothing if we cause strife and division among the brethren. Notice here, 2 Timothy chapter 3, or chapter 2, verse 23. There's a lot we could say about this section here, but I just want to focus on verse 23. Paul tells Timothy to have nothing to do with foolish ignorant controversies you know that they breed quarrels and then he goes to tell timothy and the lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but kind to everyone able to teach patiently enduring evil correcting his opponents with gentleness god may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do as well that's what god wants the outcome to be repentance repentance and turning away from the strife and division that they've caused and to serve in the lord is to be conducive to that to help bring that about but you're not going to do that if you deal with foolish and ignorant questions or controversies those things that you know will breed contentions or breed strife will cause divisions divisions is so much frowned upon for lack of a better way of putting it that in romans chapter 16 verse 17 there is an appeal there to the brethren paul says in romans 16 17 i appeal to you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught avoid them he says so if this is what we are doing within our lives then what are we good for what are we good for? And then lastly, lastly, and there's many more you could, you could throw into this, but notice in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. If we allow ourselves to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, then what are we good for? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, jumping into the middle of this particular section here, the reason why we are to grow, the reason why we are to strive for spiritual maturity, so that we may no longer be children, 
tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human, human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Um, in our backyard, we had built for Hannah's wedding a little terrace thing there. And um, put it into two planters back there in the backyard. Filled it with rocks and gravel and put dirt on top so you grow plants in it. And I thought it was pretty stable until the first good solid wind came. And down it went. Or back against our neighbor's fence, which was okay because he's got a little shed there that keeps the fence from falling down. But it did not hold its ground. So what I've got to do, I've got to pull it up and do a concrete base for it. Weight the bottom of it down, each side, then put it back in the planters. That way, when the wind comes, it stands strong. It doesn't go forward, it doesn't go backwards. Well, that's the reason why we study the Word of God. So that we can have this solid foundation. In Ephesians 6, Paul uses the term in verse 10, to be able to stand. Okay, Not like a flag tossed to and fro by everyone to doctrine. Not like uh, a child that is gullible to what others are saying. We need to stand firm. But if we allow ourselves to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, what good are we? What, what good are we to the Lord? Um, a lot of people like to research what other religions believe and teach. That's fine. It helps us to understand, you know, the, the, the misdirections and stuff taken within the study of the scriptures. It helps us to see how maybe some will, will you know, misuse what the Bible teaches. But the problem is for some people, it begins to pollute their understanding. And so they find themselves bouncing back and forth. They'll study this for a while. Oh, this has got to be the right way. And then they'll hear something different and they'll go for that for a while. Well, this has got to be the right way. And then they'll go for this. Well, this has got to be the right way. And so every time you talk to them, they found something new, something different. Tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. If we do that, then what are we good for? Now, all this points us back to what we said at the very beginning with using Judah. This is a lesson about not rebelling against God. Stopping to take the time to consider the consequences if we openly rebel as Judah did. Judah was not God's people who occasionally messed up. Judah openly rebelled. We're not talking about a people who always faithfully worshiped God there in the temple who always faithfully brought forth their sacrifices and offerings and, and, and every now and then had a minor issue to deal with, like David numbering the people, which was serious in and of itself. We're talking about a people that rebelled, that walked away. And we must make certain that we learn from that. Let us not be soiled by the world. When Jesus Christ died upon the cross of Calvary, he shed his blood so that we could be cleansed. And so the day that you became a child of God, your hearts were sprinkled in a manner of speaking, kind of symbolic of what we see in the law of Moses, a type and anti-type. But notice what Hebrews 10, 23 says. Hebrews chapter 10, there in verse 23. Let us hold fast. Actually, back up to verse 22. There we go. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And we could continue, but that's how we're supposed to live. And we have been purified. We have been made holy by the blood of Christ that was shed upon the cross of Calvary. Let us walk in that path. 1 John 2, 1 through 2, John says, My little children, I write these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, for propitiation for our sins. So let us learn from this. Let us not soil ourselves, as we said a while ago, by engaging in the works of the world. Eventually, God would take Judah back to, the, back to their land there in Judah. But they continued to reject his covenant so he eventually would establish a covenant through Jesus Christ. And because of that covenant, we can now walk in fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And if we stray, we can return to that. Because the precious blood of Christ 
shed upon the cross of Calvary, a propitiation for our sin. Now, if you are not a Christian, you need to become one. You know, stop rebelling against what God wants you to do. If you know the truth, you know you need to become a child of God, then why are you waiting? You know you need to turn away from the sin of the world. Why are you waiting? Cleansing is available. Your sins can be washed away. That's what Ananias told Saul. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, appealing to the Lord for that salvation. If you're not a Christian, you need to do that tonight. If you believe that Christ is the Son of God, then let's work on that, that conviction there. Make the decision to turn away from your sins, be buried with Him through baptism, so you rise up then to walk in the newness of life. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. I'm hoping it's not an open act of rebellion. But if it is, even that can be walked away from if you'll repent and come back to the Lord tonight. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.